This week on Fireside Chat, we'll discuss the Kevin Westgarth trade, the Flames' recent play, and how it is that Yari Hoodler and Sven Barchi didn't make Olympic teams, but somehow Peter Nedved did. All this and more, coming up. This is episode 34, Hoodler vs. Nedved, recorded January 7th, 2014. Are you ready? See you Brad. It's time for another episode of Fireside Chat. Welcome back and Happy New Year. This is Dan and Matt, and we're both back, energized, and ready to go after the holidays. Happy New Year to you, Matt. How are you feeling? Very good. It was nice to have a nice break. It sure was. I really needed that break. I don't know about you, but I really needed the break. You ready to talk Flames hockey again? Most definitely. Well, we don't have a lot to talk about this week, but I think one of the biggest things that's happened since we were on last before Christmas was the Flames' latest trade, and that was the Flames sending Greg Nemus to the Carolina Hurricanes in exchange for Kevin Westgarth. To me, I think it's a great trade. Anytime you can trade really a guy who's turned into a go-nowhere prospect and probably career AHLer in this organization for an NHL regular, be it a fourth line or not, I think you probably win that trade. What do you think? It, anytime you can trade somebody that you're not going to be having it likely in the organization in six months for something that you can actually use is always a good trade. You know, like Nemus, I don't even think should have been re-signed for this season. So the fact that we got somebody that's you know, at least playing in the NHL, you know, it's contributing to the organization positively, more so than having Nemus on it, so. When I saw the trade come down online, I had to stop and think for a minute, because I saw that we traded Greg Nemus, and I thought to myself, is he even still here? Like, I'd forgotten that he was still part of this organization. Yeah, well, it, it's unfortunate that he didn't pan out, but... You know, any, that's why I'm always leery of prospects that have skating issues, because if they're not exceptionally talented, it's very hard for them to actually make the leap. Yeah, and he was a first-round pick. He was a first-round pick, 25th overall in 2008, and he has played some NHL, NHL games. He made his debut in 2011, um, where he played nine games and got no points. So, oh, sorry, he has one assist at the NHL level. So, yeah, I mean, he's he's a guy who I think was highly touted when we got him, as I think any first-round pick is, but never came to be the player that we hoped he would be. And that happens. I mean, you know, not everyone can become a top star, and especially a Flames first-rounder, I hate to say it. Uh, we don't have good success with those guys becoming top stars. So I think the fact that we found a team who wants him is shocking, but the fact that we were able to turn him into something is exactly what you got to be doing, especially during a rebuild. If a guy's not panning out, move him and try somebody else. Yeah, exactly. And anytime you can upgrade an asset in the organization, it's always a good move. So, you know, like West Garth, like it, it, I view this trade as being more important for like the flames six to eight weeks from now after the trade deadline because if we move several of the other veterans like Camilleri, Stajan, and Stempniak you're still going to need to have some veterans in the lineup and especially with you know well likely be rookies coming up you know, you do need some protection so that way they don't get, you know, put in bad situations. I think to me, uh, Kevin Westgarth is the tough guy that we needed that Jackman wasn't. I mean, we've got McGratton here and he's kind of the, you know, fighter goon type who can still play some hockey. But I think the Flames are getting out of Westgarth what they were looking for and didn't get out of Tim Jackman. He's kind of a tough guy. He's 29, so he's still a young player, but he does have some hockey skill to him. He's never going to be a top star, but he's I think he's got some, you know, he can play some decent hockey for a fourth-line guy. 
realistically, if Westgarth is just getting under the opponent's skin and getting them off their game, like, he's accomplished his job for that game. And in the few games that he has played thus far, he has been a real pain for the other team, whether it's bumping the goalie or, you know, like last night, hitting Duchesne hard into the boards and then, you know, giving another Avalanche player a hard time. You know, it it's good. You know, like, you need that kind of agitating nuisance type. You know, like, ideally you'd get somebody that can contribute offensively, not just as the pest, but, you know, that takes time, so. Yeah, and I mean, you know, Westgarth has nine NHL points to his record, three goals, six assists during his career, and I think, and we've talked about this a lot, I think he's the right guy for now. You know, he works, like you said, he'll work here after the deadline this year. And if you look at the roster, I think he's what we need for this year. He might not be the guy going forward, but he's the right guy for right now. Yeah, like I probably wouldn't re-sign him because I know he's UFA at the end of the year. But for what we need right at this moment, he fits that role perfectly to a T. If maybe next year, you know, like that would be something you'd have to evaluate in the off season and likely post July 1st, just to see how things are shaking out with the roster. But, yeah, you know, doesn't hurt. Are you surprised the Flames were able to find a buyer for Greg Nemus and a buyer who is willing to give up an NHL piece for Greg Nemus? Uh, not especially, because, you know, the whole first-round pick thing, you know, Teams always hope that they'll find that, you know, diamond that wasn't properly used and, you know, get something useful out of it. So, you know, like, eh, I'm not shocked that he got acquired by somebody else, but, you know, if I was doing the trading, I wouldn't have gone out of my way. But that's just more familiarity with what type of player he is. Yeah, and I think, you know, even though, you know, we're saying we got a good deal because Nemus is an NHL guy, he's not a big name to have lost. And I think, you know, I believe Nemus' contract's up at the end of the year too, right? So we're essentially trading an RFA for an RFA, and I bet both sides kind of look at it the same and say, you know what? If this works, this works. If it doesn't, no harm, no foul. I mean, we could essentially go back if we wanted to and re-sign each other's players again in the off season. I doubt they will, but you you know, you might look at this as an experiment and move on from there. Yeah, exactly. No no harm, no foul. You know, you're just each team's getting to evaluate the new guy for a bit and see if it's useful to keep him and you know, move on if not. So I think as a Flames fan, I don't know about you, but I've been disappointed since Christmas. Um, the Flames have had five games since Christmas, and they're sitting at a 1-4 in four record, not counting the Phoenix game tonight, which we don't know the result of yet. How do you feel about their play? Do you think that they've um, not been playing well? Do you think they deserve more wins than they've got? Well, realistically... Uh... I think the Flames are now playing to the level that they actually are, talent-wise. They, you know, it is disappointing that we were 1-4, and four, but, you know, the Flames, like, realistically, they only have Hoodler and Camilleri as legitimate, reliable goal scorers. And, you know, like, Monaghan's coming back off of a foot injury, which you can see in his skating stride, he's still a little slower than he was at the beginning of the year. So, you know, like, really, what do you expect when, you know, like, you're throwing out your third line of, like, David Jones and TJ Galliardi plus somebody? You know, like, it... It's unfortunate, but, like, it, we're in a rebuild, and, you know, like, our start was probably, you know, a mirage more so than anything. Like, 
this team's not very good on paper, and, you know, you're gonna get rough stretches where we look like a rebuilding team, and unfortunately the last week's been that kind of thing. Yeah, and you know, we said it at the beginning of the year, and we've said it all throughout, this team is playing, or has been playing for a large part of the year, to a much better standard than they should be. They're playing, you know, they were playing to a higher caliber, and I think a lot of people started to expect a lot more out of them than perhaps the, they ever should have. So I think that, um, I think you're right in saying that this team's playing to their level now. They're playing about where their ability is. But it's exactly what we should have been expecting right from the beginning. If you're expecting anything else, um, I think that you were kidding yourself on a rebuild team. Are you, in still, are you still at least enjoying watching Flames hockey and seeing what we've been talking about all year, the kids developing and that sort of thing, or are you just getting frustrated by the games? Oh, I'm, I always find enjoyment, you know, like, it's the little things. Like, if you're focusing on, oh, we're losing again, or, like, the shots are 26 to 5 or something like that, then, yeah, you're going to get a little frustrated and disappointed. But, you know, like... I, especially lately, like, I've been watching more so, like, how Ramo and Barra have been playing in net and seeing how, like, they're adjusting now, like, especially because the Flames are playing a better, more cohesive defensive game. Like, seeing how they're adjusting to, you know, not having to be the only person helping back there. So, you know, it's... You have to focus on the little things and not really worry about, like, how badly we're getting skunked on any given night. Yeah, it's a good way to look at it. I know I was frustrated by the first couple games after Christmas. I didn't think the team was playing well. And then, like you, I kind of sat back and reflected and said, you know what, this is probably what we can expect going forward for the rest of the year. Yeah. They often say that you can't evaluate an NHL team and how well they're doing until mid-year anyways, about Christmas time or just after. Yeah, and, well, you know, like, I know from my own personal experience, I have a lot more experience than most Flames fans with, you know, experiencing really bad teams, because, like, my second favorite team is the Florida Panthers, and, well, we all know how good they've been, <laughs> so... You know, kind of used to, you know, having one of the teams I cheer for being in the basement. So, you know, it, you kind of get used to looking for the little silver linings. <laughs> Cause, well, I think as a yeah. Flames fan, too, this year, I mean, we're used to this team having rotten starts. I think that's the Flames' MO. They just have horrible, horrible starts every year. And so I think a lot of people looked at this start and said, if that's the bad start, I want to see what the rest of the season's going to look like. So maybe we were a bit spoiled at the beginning by thinking this team's better than they were instead of them coming on at the end, which would have made almost a great feel-good story to end off the season. Because usually this team starts awful and ends awful, I've found. You know, like if uh, our start to this year was like the low point, like I think the Flames would be in a playoff spot by now. Like... <laughs> It's just, you know, it, it, you can only do so much when you only have X number of scoring options on your team. Like, I don't think anybody expected David Jones to come in here and not produce anything offensively. So, you know, like, there are disappointments. You know, like, as much as, like, Russell and Giordano have, provided a lot more offense than we're used to, you know, like, it, when you only have so many guys that can do anything offensively, it makes it a lot less easy to win, so, which we've seen that yeah. before, and I definitely, like, when last year and the year before, when we ran into injury troubles, and, like, we had Como on the second line, and that, like, it, you know, it's... A lot harder to score. Yeah, well, that's one thing I was going to say, too, is this team not only ends up generally every year having a rotten start, they generally end up also running into injury trouble at some point. And it seems maybe it's just because we're Flames fans and we study them more, 
but it seems like we often run into worst injury troubles all at the same time than other teams do. And I think that might be going to happen to this team again this year. Yeah. Um, if you look, we've got... I think we got quite a few guys hurt right now. Yeah, I think there's like four or I five that are out, you know, either through illness yeah, or otherwise. Yeah, and Geo just came back, and Weidman's just about to come back. So some of them are going to come back. But I think, yeah, there's uh, there's definitely been a rash of injuries, and I think that'll keep going on. Yeah. You know, I think the one the one thing we can say, though, this year, if there's anything we're going to look at, is I think Bob Hartley has really done a lot from a coaching perspective for this team to try and make this team a cohesive unit on and off the ice. Yeah, and I actually really like what Bob Hartley is doing because he's getting the players to play with a lot of effort and putting it all out there. You know, like, he... He did have some questionable things like benching Berchi and all that earlier, but you know, like it, it's if you look at Edmonton, like they're not as focused on details and like all the little things and defensive being defensively cohesive, and like if you watch highlights of theirs. And some of the goals that they give up, you just go, like, how are you that bad defensively? And it's, Mm -hmm. like, all of their players. So, like, having Hartley focusing on things like defensive play and work ethic and all that, even if he isn't the coach next year or beyond, like, those instincts get ingrained in the team, and that's helpful in you know, getting good habits so it turns around eventually. I agree with you, yeah. And I think it's not only the coach, but, you know, he's really put together his own team. So I think even if, let's say, and I don't think it will happen, but let's say Hartley's not here next year, I think some of these assistants will stick around and they now have the same philosophy. And I think, you know, the GMs will probably work on the same philosophy. So I think even if... Hartley's not here. We will see the same philosophy from the new guy going forward, the same kind of team unity and, yeah, getting everyone to play to their best no matter what the game or what the scenario is. Yeah, and realistically, you need to work hard, especially with kids that haven't really had any experience because they don't really know better. You know, like... You can even see that with guys like Stempniak and Camilleri. Like, if you're watching them when the puck, they don't have the puck, like, they do little lazy plays that, you know, because they're used to it and they know when they can take those. But if you have a kid that doesn't really know when to slack off and when not to, you know, like, that's a problem. You know, like, that's a big problem. And... Like, Edmonton, you're seeing pretty much, like, all their skill players have that problem where they just don't know how to react when, like, they turn the puck over, you know, in a proper manner. And a lot of the time, the puck ends up in the back of the net. So, you know, it's just the little things. It's all detail work. And... You know, in order to get a team to properly rebuild, you need to focus on all the stupid little details that seem so trivial but actually do matter. <laughs> it's a good way to put it. And I think Hartley is a details guy. I think that's why he's working out here this yeah. year. Yeah, and, you know, I can't complain. So going off from that and talking about kind of players and, you know, the fact we only have two good players here... Um, I've noticed, and maybe it's just me, but it, it just seems like the the league's been so dry this year as far as trades go. Nothing's been done. And it seems like since Christmas, there's been quite a few trades made. I was actually surprised by the volume, considering we're just a few days into the new year. Um, I personally don't think the Flames are probably going to do much on the trade front until we have a new GM appointed. But what do you think? Do you think the Flames are going to look to get into the trade market soon? And if so, who do you think that they'll be looking to move? Well, it depends. Like, if the Flames announce a GM, say, like, tomorrow, 
then, yeah, they'll probably start getting the process of trading right away done. But I don't really, you know, because time is of the essence, I don't see how they can not start looking at moving guys. Because, like, the trade deadline is in March, but you have most of February off. And teams will want to get the, the new guys in the fold as soon as possible. So, like, in the next week or two, you could likely see several players move. From us, I think Camilleri, Stepniak, Stajan, and Butler are the most likely to move. And, you know, beyond that, it really just depends if you get a really good offer. Like, say somebody really wants Dennis Weidman, you know, you're not really going to turn that the down. The price is right. I think everyone on this team is for yeah, sale. exactly. Like, if someone offers you, you know, like, say Derek Broussard... Or something like that. You're not really gonna... You know, you're gonna look at it. So, it just depends. You know, like... It, yeah, I, I think there's probably a class of players will be out there shopping. And talking to other GMs about actively moving. But yeah, I mean, if anyone calls up the Flames, be it Brian Burke or whoever takes over as GM. I think you have to look at anyone if someone calls and says, I want this guy. Yeah, he's for sale. There's no one... Besides maybe Sean Monaghan at this point... And I'd argue maybe Red O'Bara, though I'd still move him for the right price. But I think everyone but Sean Monahan is for sale at this point. Yeah, I think pretty much you'd leave everybody over the age of 24 just for the time being. Unless it's like, say, like trading Sven for a defenseman that's the same age and potential. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, like if I uh, say like you were to contact Buffalo because they have like 10 really good defensive prospects and offered Sven for, say, Pisk and somebody else, like, just a minor prospect, like, that kind of trade might make sense, but it it's, I wouldn't be going out of my way right now to look at trades involving the younger players, it'd be more like the get, getting rid of the vets and you know, see what materializes. Because you just never know what offers are out there. Because, like, I know last year Feaster said that, like, they had, like, 24 teams calling on Glen Cross. So, you know, it just depends. Well, and to me, I look at the fact that the Flames, I guess the first deal in the post-Feaster era, we can officially say it, is uh, Nemes for Westgarth. And I guess to me, if we can make those kind of deals with AHL guys, I think you got to look at everything. And I'm starting to think, yeah, the Flames have to trim some fat going into next year, you know, getting ready for a new season, um, really kind of writing this one off. And I wouldn't be surprised to see a couple more um, AHL guys get traded before all said and done, to either as part of a package or as a one-for-one one with somebody else. But I think we're going to see a couple more of the guys like Nemus who – we just say, you know what, his time here is over. Let's move him and move him to someone who's interested in him. I think Joey McDonald will move by the end of the year, too. For the same reason. Yeah, you'd likely only get, like, a seventh for him, but why not? Um, yeah, throw him in with somebody else. Yeah, the thing is, is that uh, the Flames have an exceptionally large amount of quality second, third, and fourth line prospects in the AHL so you know like if you can find a team that has the opposite problem where they have like no forwards but have like a ton of defensemen like that might be a good fit yeah swap two for two or something like that because like you know like if you say traded Furland and Reinhardt for you know, like, say, Matt Clark and Kevin Lind from Anaheim, you know, like, each team would benefit because, you know, it's the opposite problem. So, it just depends, you know. You'd have to look. Yeah, I think there's lots we can do. And to me, I don't know how you feel, but often when you have an interim GM or your GM's been fired, I always worry about the guy who's taken over and his ability to make hockey moves and that sort of thing. 
Right now, I feel the Flames are totally in good hands with Brian Burke until we find somebody else. And, I mean, you know, Berkey's brought us some good players, and I have no worry that he'll continue to do that. Yeah, like, even when the new GM gets hired, uh, having Burke there as just a sounding board, you know, because he knows how good what a good deal is, you know, like, it helps, because, like, if... I, I also, I personally think that Berkey will probably be the man pulling the trigger on most deals for the rest of the year, because even when you get a new guy in, he's going to need time to evaluate the team. I mean, look at how long Brian Burke said he needed before he pulled the trigger on Feaster, because he needed to evaluate the team. So I think Burke is probably the guy right up until the deadline who's going to be doing the primary work on the trade market. Yeah. Like, that's why I'm not really expecting anyone to get hired until the off season, just because it, it's too much right now. And, you know... I think it's the right time to bring somebody in and have them kind of shadow Burke until the off season, but then they're there, they start to know the team, that sort of yeah. thing. It just depends. I do think I do think though we won't sign somebody until Buffalo does. I think that a lot of teams are waiting on Buffalo first. Well, and then us. There I think there are rumors that uh, they've hired uh, Ottawa's assistant general manager Tim Murray, but that's not confirmed from when this was going on. But it was just breaking about twenty minutes prior to the show, so. And you weren't here in our episode before Christmas, but Luke and I looked at all of the uh, candidates that have been well-known out there, um, and Tim Murray wasn't on our list of people that were rumored to be on our list or guys we thought would be good. So that, to me, is good news, because it means that the Flames' top guy is probably still on the list. Fuda from L.A. would probably be my pick, but, you know. Yeah, I don't know if you listened to the show. Um, one guy that I proposed to is Jason Botterill, the assistant GM of uh, the Pittsburgh Penguins. I think it would be worth talking to. Yeah, definitely on the short list for sure. Yeah, I, I think he's at least a guy you'd want to bring in and have a chat with. Yeah. And speaking of the GM search, uh, Matt, you actually applied for the GM job. You went down to the Dome, and what did you do? Hand in a resume, or how did you apply for the GM job? Basically, and, like, a whole package of, like, my views on, like, the current state of the team and the direction I'd take it in and all that kind of stuff. So so I have to ask, what do you put... I mean, you don't work in hockey, so what do you put on your resume for GM of the Flames? Do you put like that you led your team on the Xbox to 20 successful Stanley Cups, or what goes on a resume to turn in as a potential Flames GM? Uh, well, what I did was a little bit odd, because I actually referenced my actual day job, which is interior design, and like the skills that I use in that that are complementary to hockey skills... So, you know, and lots of other things and like my knowledge of players and the league and all that. So, okay. Yeah, just lots of And and you you didn't feel the need to start with the assistant GM job and learn from the best. You thought just dive right in and apply for the GM job? Well, it's one of those things that you know, you, you always aim high because of the fact that you just never know what, you know, like they, it's a Hail Mary long shot, but you know, it gets your name out there. It shows that, you know, like you actually are, you know, going to the effort of doing it. So they might consider you for something else or at least it gets your name out there. And, you know, yeah, I've always found that if I shoot high for something, I'll get further ahead than if I just, you know, aim for where I'm actually targeting. So, why not? <laughs> Let's be honest, you probably weren't expecting you'd hand this in and you'd actually get a call from the organization. I doubted it. I thought it was going to be about like a 10% chance, if that. 
so and I didn't. I was gonna say that high. Wow. Yeah, and I didn't, and I wasn't really expecting to. So it, it was Good. just fun. <laughs> I know a lot of people joke about it every time there's a GM opening, but you're the first guy I know that's actually gone out and actually turned their resume in. So good yeah, for you. Why not? <laughs> yeah, it can't it can't hurt to try, right? If you got the time to put something together, why not? Oh yeah. Well, plus I already had most of the notes available because I was already prepping an article, so you know it. It was coincidental timing that it kind of overlapped each other so why not so sometime in the next couple weeks do you think we could expect to see some of your notes and your thoughts around that process on the blog at firesidechat.ca oh, yeah. well especially in the next few weeks i'll be putting a lot more content on the site i've been a little bit swamped with everything all at once <laughs> so i haven't had enough free time to write coherently <laughs> long enough to actually get an don't article. you hate it when work in real life get in the way of podcasting oh yeah it's fun <laughs> working basically three jobs you know at the same time it's not fun <laughs> so So I think the other big thing that's going to be on everyone's mind this week is the Olympic rosters. And over the past week or so, we've seen all the different Olympic teams, except for Russia, as of the time we're recording this. I think they're the only, excuse me, I think they're the only ones that have not unveiled their roster. And really, I think two flames made the rosters. I think we weren't really expecting that many more. Rito Barra has made the Swiss roster, which if you look around at Swiss goalies, really him and Hiller were the only choices. And uh, Ladislav Schmid made the Czech roster. I was surprised that Yari Hudler did not make the Czech team, but that Roman Trevanka, the guy we brought in last year who was a failed experiment, did. Did that take you by surprise at all? Uh, yeah. Like, I don't really understand what the Czech Republic was thinking. You know, like, maybe there's some animosity there for some reason. I have no idea, because... Yeah, like you... I was thinking that it could be some sort of a quota thing, like in the World Juniors here where Canada has to bring an equal number of WHL, OHL, and QMJHL guys. Maybe there's a, some sort of a quota that they have internally if we have to bring so many guys playing in a European league and so many guys playing in the NHL, and he just ended up getting shafted because he was an NHL guy. That's the only logical reason I can think that you'd leave Hoodler off. Yeah, like the Czech Republic isn't exactly deep deep as a team so when you got a guy that's got over 30 points in the nhl this season you'd think that that guy would be a shoe in but whatever so yeah yeah who knows and and you're right it could it could be some sort of animosity who knows but i find it interesting that ladislav smeed gets picked but not yari hoodler yeah who knows? Because, I mean, Smeed hasn't had a great season. He's had an okay season, but Smeed hasn't had a, a great season either. Yeah. Well, Smeed's been all right it, for the type of player he is. Like, you know, if he's doing all right, like, I wouldn't say he's been bad or anything. Just there. No, but, uh, you know, if, you, if you're looking at Olympic caliber players... Oh, no. I wouldn't say he's had an Olympic caliber year, but I guess when it's, a, when it's the Czech roster... Yeah. Well, the thing is, is that with outside of Canada, USA, Sweden, and Finland, like, the rest of the teams all kind of suck, and that's including Russia. So, you know, you're going to see some rather unusual players make the rosters. Although Canada did have a few that were out of place, but, you know. That's neither here nor there. I'm looking at the Czech roster, and another guy, not just Trevanka, but another guy on here that I'm surprised made it is a 42-year-old Peter Nedved. I didn't even know that he was still playing hockey. Really? Nedved? Wow. Well, Yeah, he's 42 years old. He's currently playing in um, the Czech Extra League. So the main league in Czechs in Czechoslovakia or Czech Republic, I guess. But he made the team. He's forty-two years old, and he made it ahead of Yari Hudler. Wow. 
I didn't. I did not know that. Like, that's really bizarre. I, hell, I haven't heard his name in, like, what, six, seven years when he was with the Rangers, I think? I was pretty sure he was retired. Yeah, so did I. Like, good. Really, you know, like, I could, I'm just I taking could a look somewhat here. understand that Finland taking Solani, at least he's still playing in the NHL, but why Nedved over Hood? Well, Nedved is playing in the Czech Republic, so maybe he's kind of the hometown star going over there. Strange. Um, the last the last time Nedved played in the NHL, he was playing for the Oilers. What a surprise. And he had five points that year, and that was uh, 2006-2007. Yeah. And then he's been playing for the same team pretty much ever since. Very odd. I didn't even know he was playing still. I thought he retired right back when he was with the Oilers. Like, like that's it, not continuing on. Weird. Yeah, and Nedved is actually Czech Canadian, so it looks like he's played for Team Canada in ninety three, ninety four, and in ninety four Winter Olympics. So it looks like he has dual citizenship. So yeah, well, I mean Canada's not going to call you if you're Peter Nedved anymore. So I can see why he'd go with the Czech team if they phone. Yeah, well that had to do with the whole Soviet Union thing because he defected, if I recall correctly. So like that's why okay. he became Canadian. It, it was a weird situation, so. So if you're Yari Hoodler and you're looking at this roster and you're thinking, they took a 42-year-old guy instead of me, that's got to sting a little bit. <laughs> uh, the words I'd be using were would not be arable, put it that way. <laughs> At all. <laughs> yeah, no, I agree with you. And we, and if we said them in the same language Hoodler saying them in, we probably wouldn't even be able to pronounce yeah, them. Yeah, no. That really, really but bad language. I'm just looking here. Nedved had, Nedved had 61 points last year, but I don't know what kind of the equivalent of 61 points in the Czechs League would be to the NHL. Not very good. No. So that, that really surprises me that Peter Nedved is going to Sochi... But uh, Trevanka's or uh, Hoodler's not. Trevanka and Nedved are, but Hoodler's not. Bizarre. Well, it's the other guy that I was a bit surprised about. If you look at the Swiss roster, was that Sven Berchi wasn't taken. Yeah, like a team like Switzerland, their main problem is that they don't have a lot of offense, and like they, they usually trap and rely on good goaltending to get by. So. When you have a good offensive prospect, even though he's been struggling, you would think that you would take him just because he can provide some offense. But, you know, obviously the Swiss team thought differently. It's just really odd. I've always looked at the NHL, or sorry, not the NHL, the Olympics as a way to show off the best hockey players in your country. And I think... Part of that, too, is, hey, we've got this guy here, and he is playing in the NHL or has some NHL experience, but he's essentially a pro He's a pro hockey player in North America, even if it's the AHL. So you would, I would imagine if you're the Swiss team, you would want to show that off. It's not like they, they're like Canada, where they have more players than they can fill a roster for, so it's kind of surprising that they left him off. Even as an injury replacement or something like that, I'm surprised he wasn't named to the team. You know, the, the, all of these uh, people picking the rosters, a lot of the, the moves that they made make no sense whatsoever on, you know, like moves with Hoodler and Sven. And, like, even Team Canada's picks, some of them are just, why, what are you doing? But, you know. Hat. I'm just looking at the Swiss roster here, and I think as a Flames fan, it could have been a really good experience for Sven, for Sven to go because he probably would have played on a line with Damian Bruner and Nino Niederreiter. So that probably could have been a good line for him to be on and you know learn from those guys. Yeah. I know. it. It's disappointing. Like, I wish that he would have gotten the opportunity to go, but... Yeah, and I saw some people earlier today say, well, the reason they didn't take him is he's an NHL player, but Simon Moser, who plays for the Milwaukee Admirals, 
which is an AHL team, did make the Swiss team. So they have taken AHL guys this year already. Yeah. The one person I feel the worst for was Evgeny Kuznetsov, who was drafted by the Washington Capitals. He purposefully did not sign with the Washington Capitals because he wanted to focus his attention on making the Russian Olympic team, and he didn't. So, Do you feel worse for him than you feel for Hoodler getting snubbed by uh, Nedved? No, that stupidity is just not one of those things I feel too sorry about, and, like, that was one of the dumbest things I ever heard. So, you know, yeah. like, that's... A, I've never heard that before in modern NHL. Yeah, like, that's really, really bad. Both for planning, you know, financially and otherwise, like... Well, and teams, you know, let's be honest. If you if you're a prospect in the NHL and you don't, unless you're a top top ranked prospect, and you don't sign, teams will pass you by. They've got so many prospects in their system that not signing that one year when you have the chance could be kind of life and death for your career in the NHL. Yeah. Well, I hope that he has a good career in the KHL and maybe can return to the NHL in some capacity. Like, I don't want to see his career get ruined, but, you know, whoever is advising him should get fired. <laughs> yeah, bad agent he's got there. So, Matt, we were talking before the show about the uh, rankings and the tournament brackets and everything for the uh, Sochi Olympics. And we are talk- we are looking at the uh, International Ice Hockey Federation, the IHF, and all the teams in the Federation. And the top four teams. And I had you guess who you thought the bottom four nations were. So I thought this was kind of interesting. I thought we'd share it with our uh, with our listeners. The bottom team, if you think of the whole world, everyone that plays hockey, there's 48 nations included. The bottom nation is Georgia. We got to give them a little bit of a pass because they only joined the Federation in 2012. But was if I told you that right above them was the United Arab Emirates and then Mongolia, would that surprise you at all? Uh, not really. It more surprises me that they actually know what hockey is there, even on a limited capacity. So. And then we got uh, North Korea, Greece, Luxembourg, Ireland, South Africa, and Turkey. We were looking at this earlier. And Japan, because we were talking about how the Japanese seem to be in the women's tournament. Japan is actually ranked above Great Britain, which I found surprising. The Japanese would be ranked above Great Britain. And Japan is only one spot below the Ukraine. And if I remember correctly, the Ukraine has had Olympic qualification before. Yeah. Well, they they did have guys like Antropov, so, you know, I think. I might be mistaken. But, yeah, they did. It looks like there is a Georgian Hockey League. So it looks like some of these nations, I'm just looking at their roster on Wikipedia, and it shows them all playing for clubs with the Georgian flag next to it. So I imagine there's got to be some sort of a a league there to grab these guys from because you're not going to find someone who has dual Canadian-North Korean citizenship playing in probably any league that we would know of or UAE citizenship. Well, you could just get Dennis Rodman to play for the North Korean hockey team. (laughs) <laughs> there you go so you know if if you're if you're listening to this and you're a kid and you have citizenship in another nation you don't even need to make the nhl just become the best guy from that nation and maybe one day you will make it to the olympics because we get everyone from great britain poland the netherlands south korea lithuania romania estonia croatia spain mexico if you hold a uh, citizenship in any of those nations they're obviously looking for hockey talent. I don't know how much they actually play. Like, I don't know much about the uh, IAHF. I don't know if you do and how these teams actually qualify or who they play against. Well, if I recall correctly, like, Asia has, like, its own tournament and, like, the Middle East has their own tournament. And, like, the champions from those play, like, the lesser teams from Europe and that, like, eat. It's sort of like CONCACAF in uh, soccer and, like, all the different regions for that. And, like, they have a tournament of the best. 
so to speak, and like whoever is there advances. Yeah. To like a. F- yeah, that's what it looks like. I'm on Wikipedia, and they have different divisions. There's like one A, one B, two A, two B. Mongolia is in Division Three qualifying. So they can't even make the lowest division. Yeah. But hey, somebody's gotta somebody's gotta be last, right? Yeah. So as much as we complain about how bad our flames are doing, you can take solace in knowing that somewhere there's United Arab Emirates, a Mongolian, and a North Korean team who are last place, probably doing far worse than we are. Even far worse than the Oilers would be doing. Yeah, that's debatable. <laughs> Maybe that'd be a good exhibition game. Team Korea versus the Edmonton Oilers. Final score, Korea 8, Edmonton 1. <laughs> That'd be pretty funny. That would be pretty funny. If I were the GM and that happened, I think I'd finally have to... Uh, ask you if I was the president, I'd probably have to finally fire the GM and the coach after that. Oh, man. But... I would probably pay money to see the Oilers play the Korean team. <laughs> I'd drive all the way to Edmonton just to watch that game. Yeah. And I bet tickets would be dirt cheap. Oh, yeah, because who wants to see Edmonton lose to Korea? <laughs> <laughs> it would be so funny. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Well worth the ticket price. <laughs> oh, for sure. Just just for the just for the laughs, it'd be worth the ticket price. Or do you remember when the Flames made the playoffs and they'd play away games, and you could buy a ticket to go to the dome and watch the game at the dome? Yeah. We could do the same thing. We could just broadcast that game at the dome. Sit here in the sea of red. I think sea of red. I think the uh, Korean jerseys are red, so it looked like we're cheering for Korea. Yeah. Win win. I think it's a, it's a bit of a slow week right now as we're transitioning back from the new year. I don't think everyone's... Uh, all the teams have got their news out. I think there's probably still some GMs in uh, Christmas mode. But I don't know about you. I feel like this, I feel like the Flames have got to do something soon. Be it a GM signing. Be it making some trades. We're running out of time to get a lot done this year. Yeah. And, you know, like, those deadlines start creeping up on you pretty quick. So, you know, like, that trade deadline isn't as exactly. far away as we think it is. So, you know. No, and, and I mean, Brian Burke is probably going to be in Sochi because he's working with the U.S. Olympic team. So if he's there, he's probably not going to be focusing on the Flames a lot while he's there. So I can see him wanting to get his work done, whatever that work is, deadline-wise, before he goes. Or have it all lined up and make the trades when he gets back. Yeah. And, you know, like, especially with, say, like, Camilleri and that, like, you're going to want him to have enough opportunity to practice with the team. Uh, so that way, like, you, you're you hoping that your first or second line players get chemistry with them. So, like, if you're leaving it till after the Olympics, like, you're only getting a couple of weeks worth of ice time with them but if you get them like say like two weeks prior to the olympics you got all that time plus the olympic break plus the end of the season that's a good way to look at it yeah it um it it gives you a chance to get them in get them watching your video that sort of thing yeah and like if you got like a fourth line grinder like west garth and you're moving him well, that's not really that big of a deal. You can, like, that's not vital. Yeah, you know, they just do their own thing and that's it. So, yeah, you know, it's, you'll likely see the bigger names start moving shortly. Yeah, I, I think too, like you said, because of the Olympic break, because you want to get them in before the break, do you know if there's actually a trade freeze during the Olympic break? I have no idea, but I would imagine so. Because that'd be a little weird yeah, like, if think you're so too. at I mean, the Olympics and like you just magically, when you return home, you have to go to a different team. Like That'd be a little weird. Yeah, two, two guys at the Olympics get traded for each other, so just swap return tickets and away you go. That'd be kind of neat. <laughs> it, it'd be kind of an interesting story, wouldn't it? Um, but yeah, I can see that trade happening soon. I, I also think that if you look at the deadline, and I think GMs know this as well as we do, you tend to overpay on the deadline. So if you can get the deal done early, you 
probably won't have that rush of we're trying to get this deal done before how many other teams on the deadline. So I think, and we've seen that more and more lately. We see the big players going a week or two before the actual deadline. Yeah, and you know, like it's not like they're just gonna take the first deal that hits them, but you know, no. It, it, but it also gives us time to evaluate the deal because we're not rushing trying to get things in for the noon deadline. Yeah, exactly. All right, well, if that's all we got to talk about, I think we'll uh, finish up here. Yeah, I want to remind everybody before we go to check us out online. Uh, www.firesidechat.ca is our website. You can follow us on Twitter, at Fireside Podcast. We got really good um, commentary of the games going on there. We talk about hockey all week. And our Facebook is facebook.com slash firesidechat. And again, we're always talking about Flames Happenings. Uh, we let people know about the West Garth trade right when it happens. So if you need your flames fill, come see us there. And Matt, you do commentary during the away games on your Twitter account, right? Uh, not the last couple, still... but most of them, yeah. And you're still going to be doing that for this new oh, year? Oh, yeah. Just I've been busy for a lot of the so road f- games the last little bit, so I haven't actually even watched them. Like, I've recorded them, and I haven't watched them afterwards. So... Yeah, we don't want to see your we don't want to see your commentary two three days after. Yeah. So if someone did want that commentary when you come back to doing it, where can they find you on Twitter? Uh, my Twitter handle is at caged great. I think I'm over seventy followers now, so it's getting there. Nice, you're getting up there, moving on up. All right, well, thanks, Matt. We'll see you yeah, next week. Take care. Fireside Chat Podcast, produced and edited by Dan Stevenson.